Let's go right into it in Islam and tell you about what's happening. Islam Exposed, part four. We're going to go for the, uh, before we start, let me give you a quick snapshot of Islam. Not what we've done before, but just a quick snapshot. We know that we're going to do this. We're going to be at the number four, the teaching of Islam. Now, why do we need to hear about Islam? Because, as you'll see tonight, uh, you're going to, sooner or later, and I bring, believe it's more sooner than later, you're going to be involved with talking to somebody who's a Muslim in your life. Uh, I'm going to tell you that, because, and I'll show you some of the statistics that prove that out. So let let me give you a little bit of a brief uh, summation about uh, Islam and tell you just a little bit about it. Uh, we've been teaching it quite a bit, bit uh, the last couple of weeks. A monotheistic religion. They believe in one God, uh, started by Muhammad in the 7th century AD. Muhammad claimed to be the greatest of the prophets, including Moses and Jesus. Uh, Islam means submission uh, to the will of Allah. Muhammad's revelation occurred over a 23-year period. The Quran was written later, but he kept getting these visions over 23 years. The Quran is Islam's holy book. It means that which is to be read. Members of Islam are called Muslims, those who submit. And Islam involves the five doctrines and the five uh, pillars of faith, which you will hear tonight. So, uh, to follow any movement or religion, one must adhere to and follow their teachings. You are a Christian. You follow the teachings of Christ. Uh, Islam follows a certain amount of teachings. It's very important for us to understand a religion. We must understand what they believe and how that differs from the Word of God that we have. So, the basic teaching, uh, because the basic teaching of of Islam is, call, is to call, cause the whole world to submit to Allah one way or the other, either peaceably or by the sword. The, the, the Quran says that in many, many places, their chapters are called surahs, and they say it in many places to, to sub, make the world submit to Allah. It's all about submitting to Allah. So tonight, hopefully, you'll get an understanding of what Islam, the heart of Islam is, and in their teachings. So uh, if Islam has made, in your life and mine, has made more inroads to the West than ever before. Most Westerners don't know a whole lot about Islam. Islam really didn't touch America until your lifetime. And so Islam was pretty much, it's been there for 1400 years, but pretty much in the Middle East and Northern Africa. And now we're seeing it that is infiltrating Europe, it is infiltrating the West, it's infiltrating Australia. It's going everywhere. It has a push, a worldwide push. It's rapidly making itself known to the rest of the world. Uh, it was heavily con uh, concentrated in the Middle East. This will give you a little bit of an understanding of the Middle East. Uh, these are Sunni and Shia majorities, both uh, two different spots of Islam, all Islam, two different uh, two different sects of Islam. We'll talk about those later on in another teaching. But this is, uh, look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is 99% Islam. Yemen is 100% Islamic. The United Arab Emirates is 96% uh, Islamic. Bahrain is 100% Islamic. Iran, you have 99% uh, Islamic. You have Iraq. Look at Iraq. Iraq is almost uh, 90, uh, it's 90, almost 100%. Uh, Syria is is 80, 90 percent, and you have Turkey. And you, we, so we see these nations are massively controlled by Islam. Now to have Western teachers and Western prime ministers and Western Western uh, presidents over these nations, we're setting ourselves up for a massive a massive revolt, and that's exactly what happened in the Arab Spring. And it's rapidly making itself known to the rest of the world. Uh, Muslim population in the world. Let me show you this. This is the population in the world. This is where it's growing. This is where it's going. This is uh, from this right here is the heavenly con concentrated uh, that tells you about 200 million or plus and you'll see that right in here Islam and in here look at Indonesia and now we're starting to see it spread all through Africa Russia uh, lower parts of Russia uh, 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 Uzbekistan is 82% Islamic and um, America, United States and Canada. So we're watching it. We're watching Islam spread over the world. They have a desire for world conquest. That's what they're there for the world to submit to Allah, submit to Islam. And its radical terroristic impact has literally affected every single nation in, in the, on the planet Earth except one. The only nation not affected by Islamic terrorism is Greenland. And so if you want to see the map there, the, this is just from 2013. This is the, this this is the spot going from the very, very heavy, dark color. That's the most uh, terroristic, uh, uh, terroristic attacks that have happened. And you'll see the most of them are happening right here in that Middle East and all Boko Haram over here. And you'll see it over here in the Middle East right there. So Pakistan is here. So we're watching this high impact. And now it's starting to hit the rest of the world. The only place in the world that has not had a terroristic attack uh, in 2013 was Greenland. And that has been multiplied tremendously in 2016. Now, although many Muslims live in democratic nations, England, France, Greece, United States, they use the principles of democracy to destroy it. Somebody say amen. Islam uses freedom and democracy to destroy freedom and democracy.
the men who came in 9-11 and took down the two trade towers were on a holy jihad, a holy war. We'll tell you about what that means in a moment. And as they came, they were allowed, even though they were fundamental radical Muslims, they were allowed to dress as Westerners, they were allowed to go to bars and to drink, they were allowed to smoke, they were allowed to do anything that you did, or not you, but the Americans did, to blend in. They were allowed to do anything, including uh, be with prostitutes or anything, because it was in the name of Allah. This is the deception. Even though they want to appear as something that's, that's, a, that's a different submission to Allah, they can use anything available to them to infiltrate a, infiltrate a society. That's dangerous. In 1960, how much are they infiltrating America? In 1960, the United States had a total of 20 mosques. From 2000 to 2000, 2010, the mosques in the United States increased by 74% to 2,106, 2010. Today, there are four th over 4,000 mosques in the United States. Where are they? Well, they're everywhere. These are the mosques in the United States. Again, the dark, one, the dark color is the most mosques. Most mosques are in New York and California. Texas has a tremendous amount. Georgia, our neighbor, and also Florida, and Michigan and Wisconsin have a tremendous amount of mosques. If you want to see where they are specifically, here you go. Texas has uh, 500 and 362. California, 535. New York, 563. Alabama has uh, 18. Georgia, 95. Florida, 153. And there's more and more going up every day. Now, am I against religion? Of course I'm not against religion. But when Donald Trump says that we need to vet these areas, most of the terrorism that comes from America has some affiliation with a mosque. What if we had Christian terrorists and they were parts of churches? Do you not think the church, do you not think the government would sur survey the churches? Come on. They, sure they would. Well, we're not doing anything like that. Let me just tell you how much they're growing. Uh, the, let me show you their, their meteoric rise in congregation size. By the way, one of their congregations is called a Masjid. It's M-A-S-J-I-D. And this is their meteoric rise. These are the fastest growing uh, religious organizations in America. This is from 2000, year 2000. The Assemblies of God was one of the fastest growing religious congregations. They were surpassed by Latter-day Latter Saints from 95 to 2000. The Muslims surpassed both of those, and megachurches surpassed those. Now Muslims have surpassed megachurch congregations in their growth, how much growth they have, whether it's 10% or 15%. So they are growing faster than any religion in America. And I'm telling you, you are not being told this. No one's being told this. So it's okay if it was a different religion. I understand that. I understand people want to want to want to worship a different way, but this is not a religion. This is a civilization overtake. Uh, so basically what we're watching is we're watching America being infiltrated uh, by something that wants to take over all the, uh, all the standards that we have. They want Sharia law. They want something that's going to, and I'm not being, I'm not being melodramatic. This is exactly what their, what, their, what their constitution, their religious law says. Submit. Get the world to submit. Get them to submit to Allah. They have to submit to Allah by peace or by war. And that's just in 2000. Today, 16 years later, they are are the fastest growing religious movement in America. So what are their doctrines? What do they believe? What do they teach? Shouldn't we know that? Shouldn't we know what this, what this fast growing movement is teaching? Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Before I explore their teachings, let me remind you of what the Apostle Paul said. Uh, concerning teachings other than Jesus' words and contradictory to Jesus' words. Paul said this. He said... If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, he knows nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, and evil surmisings. He says we have to have a basis of truth. That basis of truth has to be Jesus' words. If I preach to you something that's not Jesus' words, I'm going to cause strife and railings and envy. I'm going to cause things that are not right. And so he's saying no one should be teaching us that doesn't teach Jesus' words. Come on, someone say amen. So, uh, as we continue to see this, uh, we, are, we are teaching on Islam. Are they contrary to Jesus' words? What does Islam really teach? Well, they have two fundamental cores of their beliefs. First, it's what's called the five pillars. And if you know anything about Islam, this is basic. They have five pillars, and these pillars are called the Hajj. Well, I'll give them in order. Shahada, how many remember that? The Asala, the, so, the uh, Zakah, the Son, and the Hajj. Those five pillars are extremely important to Islamic people. They have to do these. And I'm going to tell you what they are in a moment as you continue to just listen to what's going on here. And I can fill you in a little bit before I really kind of get you to 
to Christianity here for a moment. The five pillars are these. So you have the Shahada, which is the creed. There is no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his, is his messenger. Salat is prayer. Very big on prayer. We'll tell you about that tonight. The Psalm is fasting. The Hajj is a pilgrimage to the Hajj. And the Zakat is almsgiving. So let me just give you briefly what these are, and then I'm going to explore one of them. The first pillar is the Shahada. It's the creed. The creed they recite is called, recite, uh, recite is called the Shahada. It's equivalent to our salvation prayer. You're required to state the Shahada passionately and publicly. How many of you know that you can get saved all by yourself in your house? You can't be a Muslim all by yourself in your house. It has to be public. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. The second pillar is prayer. A Muslim has, set, has five set times to pray each day. He will pray facing Mecca from the Muslim prayer guide. Listen, if a, this is from the Muslim prayer guide. If a dog, a donkey, or a woman passes by a Muslim in prayer, his prayers are rendered ineffective. Golly. Come on. I'm going to tell you what that prayer means because I've been to Israel quite a few times. I've been to the Middle East quite a few times, over 40 sometimes. And uh, every time I'm in Israel, I hear the call to prayer early in the morning. I hear it five times a day. I, hear, I see them get up. I've been in, I've been in buses where the, where, the, where the Islamists and Muslims have, uh, when the call of prayer comes out, they take that little carpet, they bring it out, and they, uh, they do their prayer thing, and then, they, and then that, that it's over, and then they do it again and again. They've got to wake up early in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning to do it. Listen, I'm going to tell you what that means. And, and most people say, I had one person on the, on the group say, man, that is so admirable that they're praying. Do you know what they're praying? Do you know what they're doing? Well, let me just tell you. Let me go on first before I get back to there. The third pillar is almsgiving. Muslims give, you ready for this? 140th of their estate to the mosque. 140th? Are you kidding me? You know what that means? If they earn $400 a week, they give $16. If you earn $400 a week, you give $40. Muslims have it easy in almsgiving. Come on, somebody say amen. The fourth pillar is fasting. Fasting occurs in the middle of Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. During that fast, Muslims go to without water, without food, or sexual relations from sunup to sundown. I suppose attitudes begin to improve at sunset during Ramadan. What do you think? The fifth pillar is pilgrimage. As a Muslim, you're supposed to go visit Mecca at least once in your lifetime. And I'll show you pictures of Mecca. But let me, go back to, let me go back to Salat, their prayer. Let me tell you a little bit about their prayer. Five times a day, facing Mecca, they do this. They have th this position they stand in for. They stand. It's called their standing prayer. They recite the exact same seven verses from the first chapter of the Quran every single time. They do it 24-7. Every time a call to prayer is up, they stand up and they recite seven verses. They know them from when they're a kid. They continue to recite them over and over every time. Uh, the, and then they can throw in another, another verse that they remember. Usually it's just one that they say. Then they go into a bow. When they bow, they have to bow to Allah and they must say this, Glory be to my Lord God Almighty. That's all they say there. And they say it every single time. When they bow, they say the exact same thing. Then they have to go prostrate. Not prostate, but prostrate. Uh, they say, and they have to say, Glory be to my Lord Most High. They have to ask Allah for bounty, blessings, forgiveness, and mercy. That's probably the longest part of their prayer because they're asking for something for themselves. And then they sit. That's part of their prayer. And that sit is, uh, they say, a repetitive, memorized prayer, which includes these words. It says, Peace be upon us, all of Allah's slaves. And then they beg Allah to bless Muhammad and his family. That is the Muslim prayer. It's the same prayer, five times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. After the rep repetitive prayer, they turn to their left and they turn to their right, always to their left and then to their right, sending Allah's peace on those who are surrounding them. Always the same prayer, the same words, the same actions. It's repetitive and it's vain because it's asking for Allah to bless Muhammad and his family. So what does the Bible say about that? Well, Jesus said this, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. Let me tell you, I'm not calling the Muslims heathens. Jesus is. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And they do. They, had, they pray five times a day. They would put us to shame in their regularity of prayer. But they're not saying anything. They're saying the same thing over and over again. It's a rote thing. It's a rote prayer that they pray. Listen, I was brought up Roman Catholic. Some of you may have been brought up Roman Catholic. I knew my Roman Catholic prayers just like that. I can pray them over and over and over again. I very rarely prayed from my heart. I remember going back home when I got saved and, I was, uh, they, and uh, my mom on a rare occasion asked me to pray for our food. I got up and I prayed and uh, her family was all there and I got down and uh, I prayed for my heart and somebody said to me, one of my family members said, 
when did you memorize that? <laughs> Prayer has to be spontaneous. Somebody say amen. If you have anybody that's praying that's not spontaneous, it's a rote prayer. It means nothing. I don't want Cheryl to come and tell me she loves me reading off a paper. You know, this is exactly what's happening in, in Islam. So when you see somebody praying in Islam, and we have this tendency, the world has this tendency to think that they're so holy. That has nothing to do with holiness. Come on, somebody is saying them. And it has to be public, by the way. Islamic prayer has to be public. It has to be in front of other people. Open to be, uh, it has to be open and public to be effective so Allah can hear them. Obviously, Allah has some problems with his hearing. So he's got to hear them openly and in public. The more they pray in public, the more people are there, the, lo the louder they are, the more Allah can hear them. So, again, Jesus' words. That thine alms may be in secret, thy Father which sees the secret shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And the Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Why do they have to go to Hajj? Because at Hajj they pray. Those white spots are people bowing in prayer. Millions of them. Hajj in Mecca. Can you imagine a church service like that? Millions. But they do it so they can be seen. So that all can hear them in one group. This is not what Jesus told us to do. This is just part of the outside of the Hajj. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Just because we see these images. Listen. Doesn't mean someone is holy or righteous or forgiven of their sins. They may be sincere, but according to Paul, they are still in their sins. Unless they believe in Jesus as a son of God who forgives their sins. Now let me just say one thing. This goes out on the internet. Muslims listen to this. We know that. This is not against an individual. I want people to know this. This is something you have to search out. If you believe that the Bible is something that Muhammad built upon, which Muslims do, then I'm going to encourage you to look at the scriptures I just wrote, read to you and understand that you have to go against these scriptures in order to believe the Quran. If, 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 if what Muhammad said is true, that he is the next prophet building on the other prophets, then he is just gone against one of the greatest prophets in, in Islam, which is Isa, Jesus. So how could Muhammad say he's the greatest prophet and Jesus was one of the greatest prophets and go against what Jesus said? Just a question for you, just to listen to. Again, this is not just, a, this is not just going here, it's going out into the world, so I want you to know that. What does the Bible say? Well, Ephesians says this, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. Islam does not believe that they have forgiveness of their sins through Jesus Christ. They don't believe it's a blood sacrifice. Even though they believe that, that uh, Ishmael was a shadow and type of something, that Abraham tried to kill him and God stopped him because God wanted to see blood, they missed the shadow and type by not fulfilling the fact that, it, that, is, that Isaac, not Ishmael, was the shadow and type of Christ who would shed his blood. But Islam does not believe in that shedding of blood for salvation. Ephesians says this, and you have you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You can pray all day long. You can get a billion people in one spot. You can bow, you can kneel, you can stand, you can sit. If you pray and you pray and you pray and you have not had your sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus says you will never see heaven. It's not a matter of what we do. It's a matter of what Jesus did for us. Come on, somebody say amen. Even when we were dead in sins, Ephesians 2.5, He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, not works. All of that, the hajj, is a work. Those five pillars are works. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and Allah will accept you. The Bible is totally the opposite of that. Yes, works will follow, but that's not why God accepts us. He accepts us not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did. Jesus did it all. It's not us. You can't earn your way to heaven. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ has also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So we know that the whole idea of Christianity, which Islam believes it's founded upon, they believe it's the next step. Muhammad was the next great prophet. They, came, he, he, they believe in Noah. They believe in Abraham. They believe in Jesus. They call him Isa. They believe in the Torah, which is the Jewish word. They believe in the Bible. And then they believe that the next step is Islam. If they believe that, then obviously they're going to have to throw out the Bible, which you will see coming in a moment. 
So these are the five pillars. It's what they do. Islam is all about works, what you can do for Allah. Christianity is all about grace, what God can do for you. Come on, somebody say amen. So this is what they do. So what do they believe? Well, they have the five fundamental beliefs. Here they are. The five fundamental beliefs. God is Allah, the Arabic word for God, meaning simply the one to be worshipped and obeyed, like Elohim in Hebrew. Then they believe in angels, God's servants, messengers in heaven. Gabriel is the angel of revelation, who Muslims believe recited the Quran to Muhammad. They believe in the scriptures, their prophets, and their day of judgment. Let me give it to you a little bit more detail. Uh, these five fundamental beliefs, uh, most of them are corruptions of our own Bible. They believe in, let me, let me expound them just a little bit. Their, their first one is belief in God, faith, really. Uh, it says, The messenger of Allah may be blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, said to Imam, uh, You should believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and in the last days that you should believe in divine destiny, both good and evil. First, number one, faith in God, Allah, uh, the absolute unity of God. No Jesus is God's son, no Trinity. Idolatry, that is associating anyone like Jesus with God, is the one unforgivable sin and is called association in the, in the uh, Arabic shrik. So they're saying you, idolatry is believing that Jesus is God's son. And they say it's blasphemy against God. Isn't that interesting? Because bla and they say it's unforgivable. Yet our Bible says the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin. Then they have the belief in angels. Muslims are to believe that angels exist and are used by God to perform his will. One duty to, is to watch over humans and to keep record of all their actions. The most famous angel is Gabriel, who served as an intermediary between God and Muhammad in the revelation of the Quran. Another is Iblis, I-B-L-I-S, the chief of all angels, but disobeyed God and was cast out of heaven. After that, he was turned into Satan, who now rules hell and also tries to tempt people from the path of Allah. The next one is the prophet in the scriptures. Islam sees itself as a culmination of the great prophets of old, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. God gave them all books. Moses had the the Tuah, which is the Torah. David was given the Zabur, which is the Psalms. And, uh, and Jesus, Esau, was given the Evangel or the Gospel. Jesus was not given the Gospel. Jesus did not write the Gospel. The Gospels were written about him. But the law, the, the Jews and Christians have corrupted the Scriptures. Tarif, corruption. They altered them, omitting things from them and adding things to them so that Jewish and Christian Scriptures as they now exist cannot be trusted. The Quran, in contrast, is completely uncorrupted, so that every word is exactly what God revealed long ago to Muhammad, is what they believe. Final judgment, we'll talk about this later, that there will be a judgment day when all people will be rewarded, which are Muslims only, or punished, all non-Muslims, for their actions. And divine decree and predestination, they believe that God controls what happens, including who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. But at the same time, there is limited free will and individual moral responsibility. Sounds almost like some of the things we believe. And again, quickly in the chart, just so you don't get confused, they believe this. One unique and comparable God with no son or partner. Allah is the proper name of God, the God. Belief in God's revealed books, the Torah, the Injil, which is the Bible, and the Quran. Belief in prophets of God, Adam, Noah, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Jesus, the final prophet, the messenger, Muhammad. And you have to always say, peace be upon him. It says them there. Belief in the day of judgment when all humanity will be held accountable for their deeds again we'll go into that a little bit de deeper belief in the angels of god belief in kadar which is predestined and due measure so they believe in these five these are five fundamental beliefs they would like you to believe that their view of jesus is the same as yours this is the cr controversy that happens in america we think and the pope has even said it that it's another path to the same god let me show you how it's not this chart is the best one i can come up with but let me show it to you these are what our common beliefs are about jesus muslims believe he's sinless, so do we. Muslims believe he had a virgin birth, so do we. Muslims believe he performed miracles, so do we. Muslims believe he's the word of God, believe it or not, so do we. Muslims believe he will return, so do we. Muslims believe he's the Messiah. They should just stop there. Come on, somebody say amen. But watch what they believe. They believe he's a revered prophet, as we believe he's the Son of God incarnate. They believe not the Son of God. We believe the Savior of the world. They believe he was never crucified, but was taken to heaven bodily. They believe the Messiah is for the Jews only. We believe he was crucified and resurrected, part of the Trinity, and Messiah for the entire world. They are totally deviant when it comes to believing in Jesus the way you and I believe in Jesus. Islam and Christianity has nothing in common. Islam is, a, is diametrically opposed to Christianity. So what about the 
other beliefs. They have many, by the way. Here's just a few of the other beliefs that they have. Let's talk about the big five, I call them, since we're on fives. Death, heaven, hell, judgment, and resurrection. Well, Bible, Bible, um, Bible uh, corrupted. Let's talk about that first. Uh, let me tell you, tell you what's going on. People changed the words of Jesus, they believe. They didn't change the, the words of other prophets, though, like Moses and uh, Abraham. Just Jesus' words. How convenient. Allah has no son, no such thing as a trinity. The Quran says, it says this in the Quran, nothing can be three in one. Obviously, and apparently, they've never studied an egg and its three parts, shell, albumin, and an oak. They never studied the skin, the three parts, dermis, epidermis, and subcutaneous layers. They never studied the eye, the pupil, the iris, and the cornea. They've never studied the triangle with three equal parts. And they've never studied the parts of the ear, three parts of the ear, the inner, the outer, and the middle ear, or the three parts to man, body, soul, and spirit. Now listen, they said, their third belief is this, man is composed of body, soul, and spirit. I thought nothing three could be one. But they believe that man's composed of body, soul, and how many are with me? They believe man has no sin at birth, no original sin, and his duty is to submit to Allah. Now listen, because I'm going to be taking this apart in a moment. Forget that they just contradicted their no trinity statement. Nothing can be three and one. Man is born in sin. We know that. Scriptures teach us that. Four, man has not lost his way. They believe that. If none of us have sinned at birth, how is it that all of us have... No, well, man has lost his way. If none of us have sinned at birth, how is it that we've all lost our way? All eight billion of us. If we are all repentant and submit to Allah, though, we can be forgiven. Surah 17.35 No atonement, no sin nature, no need for a savior. What an eternal gamble. What a lie. What a totally damning doctrine. What a shame for millions and millions of followers of Islam. The next thing, five, Jesus was sinless, but not the Son of God. Here's another contradiction. If they believe he was sinless, then he didn't need Allah. He didn't lose his way. Come on. Because he didn't lose his way. Six, okay, get ready for a shocker. Jesus did not die on the cross, they believe, but ascended directly to heaven. And who do Muslims believe died on the cross instead of Jesus taking his place that all the eyewitnesses and disciples knew but lied about? Who do you think they believe died on the cross? You're never going to believe this. Here's the shocker. Muslims believe that Judas took Jesus' place on the cross and was crucified in his place. How many have learned something tonight? Just listen. They believe this. It would have been unthinkable for Allah to have one of his prophets be crucified. Therefore, the crucifixion to Muslims is reviewed as, dis as disrespectful and disgraceful. Of course it's disgraceful. That's what Jesus came for. To disgrace himself that you can have grace. The whole idea in disgracefulness, there's a word in disgracefulness called grace. He, he was disgraced so you can have grace. This is the whole idea of a savior. He became nothing and became low so that you could become high. He died so you can live. When Islam says, well, we would never hurt our prophets like that, that's because you revere your prophets and you don't understand that God reveres us. God says, I will die for them. It's called love. Islam has no love. God is full of love. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Salvation is complete surrender to Allah. All you have to do is say the words. All you have to do is submit and all, to Allah. Do works, do the five pillars. Human effort is pivotal to the Islamic view of salvation. Galatians 2.16 tells us this. Uh, right here. It says... Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by the faith, and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So their other beliefs are these. The Bible is corrupted. Allah has no son. Man is composed of body, soul, spirit. has no sin at birth. Man has lost his way. Jesus was sinless, but not the Son of God. Is a lesser prophet than Muhammad. Jesus did not die on the cross. And salvation is complete surrender to Allah. That's their beliefs. The big five, as we go on, which I'm going to tell you about right now, are the ones that I really want to concentrate tonight on. I told you this. Death, heaven, hell, judgment, and resurrection. Well, death. They believe every single human being ever born will die. Surah 135.8. Every soul will ta have a taste of death. And they believe it is. At the time of death, the angels stretch forth their hands and say, yield up your souls. Uh, so here's another contradiction. First, Muslims, let me just tell you, Muslims claimed and Muhammad claimed that Jesus didn't die. But their Quran says that every person born has to die. 
they're contradicting themselves. They say he ascended while he was alive, going against what the Quran says. And believe me, the interpretation, little interpretation, is every single human born on planet Earth has to die. And they believe Jesus was only human. So they contradicted themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not really planning on dying. They have nothing to give me. I'm planning on being raptured. Amen. I'm now, my death may happen in the meantime, but I am not planning on staying on this planet. I'm planning to do something like this. King James Version, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, so forever to be with the Lord in the air. I'm not planning on dying. I'm planning on going in the rapture. I believe we're in the last days. Now, I may very well die, but until I die, I'm planning on getting out of here. I'm planning on being resurrected, not on a, from a dead body, but resurrected while I'm alive on the rapture. When Jesus comes back, I believe that that is the glorious hope of the church. So you take the hope away, and what do you have? Oh, all of you are going to have to die, and then you're in the hands of Allah. I'm sorry, I don't want to be in the hands of Allah. I want to be in the hands of Jesus Christ. I want the trumpet to blow from on high. I want to resurrect. I want to see the graves where all the bodies come up that have served them in the past and meet their spirits. We are living in the last days, and I'm looking not to die. I'm looking to be resurrected. Resurrected. Come on, somebody say amen. Heaven. The Muslim concept of heaven is warped. It's extremely warped. The faithful will enjoy gentle speech, shade, meat, and drink of their desire. There will be circulated among them a cup of wine. Forget the fact that they don't drink it now. From a flowing spring, white and delicious to the drinkers. Not bad, no bad effect is in it, nor will there be any intoxication. And with them will be women limiting their glances with large, beautiful eyes. One part of the story says black eyes. So if you're blue-eyed, you don't have a chance. And if they were delicate, as if they were delicate eggs, well protected. And they will approach one another, inquiring of each other. A speaker among them will say, indeed, I had a companion on earth who would say, are you indeed of those who believe that when we have died and become dust and bones, we will indeed be recompensed? He will say, would you care to look? And he will look at, see him in the midst of hellfire. He will say, but Allah, you almost ruined me. That's directly from the Quran. This is heaven. It's a very warped concept. Now, I don't know about, I don't know where anybody gets the concept of heaven as a place where you sit around and gorge yourself in the pleasures of life as we know them on planet Earth. And if you're a Muslim male and you die blowing yourself up in a holy jihad, uh, you get 72 virgins and any pleasures you desire, usually sexual. That's a moderate change, by the way, from the Muslims used to believe in the 11th century. See, in the 11th century, we had the Crusades. So in order to get Muslim men to fight in the Crusades, their imam at that time that they all believed in, his name was Mullah Ali Kwami, and by the way, anybody on YouTube can look that up, he made a special decree and said, no, we've been interpreting it wrong. He says, if you go to the Crusades and you die for Allah, you are going to get, are you ready for this? For the men are going to get 500 wives, 4,000 virgins, and 8,000 previously married women. <laughs> Valentine's Day is going to be a bummer. <laughs> and what do women get? Now we're seeing women blow themselves up. We're seeing a woman just did that in Baghdad. She blew herself up. What would a woman get if she goes to heaven? Well, you ready for this? They get their husbands. Some of them don't even want their husbands, but they get their husbands. And if they were married more than once, one husband died, they get their best husband, and they get to be, they get to be superior to all his virgins in heaven. That may be why some female suicide bombers have been heard saying this when they die, before they die. I will be chief among 72 dark-eyed virgins, the fairest of the fair. Women are so put down in Islam. How about hell? For Muslims, it's a place of unbelievable suffering. Boiling water melts out one's skin. Scorched skins are immediately replaced with new ones so they can taste uh, the torment of hell anew every time. It, they believe it has seven levels, seven levels of torture. People in hell will eat food, and it'll all be bitter. Angels, good angels, are on guard to supervise the punishment. People in hell will be able to talk to people in heaven, asking them for, to send some food, but Allah won't allow it. Angels will constantly ask them, constantly, for eternity, why did you not accept the Prophet Muhammad's words? Why did you not accept the Prophet Muhammad's Lord's words? They will live in houses. There will be days and nights. Wow. Muhammad, again is the central figure here. Let me suggest to you that Muhammad is no prophet. Islam has set him up as a god. Look what Jesus says. He says something pretty different. 
I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of hell and of death. He has opened it up for us. He has given something that says, there, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to your death. How about judgment? What did they say about judgment? Well, Surah 148.13 says, Whosoever does not believe in Allah and his messenger, then surely we have prepared burning fire for the unbelievers. I'm amazed at this, at this verse because it's talking in a first person about God, and it says, we, I thought Allah was singular, we have prepared burning fire for the unbelievers. Who's we? Is it Allah just alone? Is they, are they monotheistic? Or is it Allah and Muhammad? So Muhammad's really not a prophet. He's actually a god himself. Muhammad sounds like a god to me. Then surely we have prepared burning fire for the unbelievers. You still with me tonight? By the way, even Muslims can go to hell. You've got to be a bad Muslim. Five reasons. Not worshipping Allah. Not offering salah or prayer. Not feeding the poor, idle talk, backbiting, lighting, speaking without knowledge, and denying the day of resurrection. A Muslim can go to hell, but it's very rare for a Muslim to go to hell, the surah says. But every non-Muslim goes to hell. Oh, but Allah will judge everyone fairly. Islam says that your good deeds will go on a scale weighed against your bad deeds. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you can go to heaven. If your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you go to hell. The only problem with that is the only good deed, good deed that can outweigh all the bad deeds is you being a Muslim. It's taken right from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Horus, no, excuse me, Anubis, the god of death, has a scale. He, this is a canopic jar. Your heart's in there. He puts your heart on one side and you put your fe a feather on the other. If your good deeds are so great that, the, that, it's, that it's lighter than the feather then you can go to heaven for an Egyptian. It's the exact same thing. The only problem with Islam is that everybody's heart that's not, that's not a Muslim is going to be, is going to be heavier than, their, than their, their good deeds because you have not accepted Muhammad as Allah's messenger. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, the resurrection. Allah will resurrect all who have died. He'll recreate each individual's body and rejoin it to, his, to its soul. That's probably because we see so much death and in martyrdom and in, in blowing themselves up. Male Muslims in paradise will spend most of their time in eternity enjoying the rewards of the flesh and the pleasures of flesh, including sexual intercourse. That will be the mainstay of a Muslim male in, in, in heaven. There will be a river of milk, a river of wine, and black-eyed virgin beauties. It's why young male Muslims will, with nothing to live for are so willing to die today. Look what Jesus said about the resurrection. He said, the same day came to him Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother will marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no issue, he left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. Then they say this to Jesus. And last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto him, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. There is no sexual intercourse in heaven, according to Jesus. Now, if Jesus is a great prophet that Muhammad is building on, then Muhammad just called Jesus a liar. How many are with me tonight? So, let's just conclude a little bit and give you a little bit. Islam is the glorification of fleshly desires. It's the reward of individual selfish desires. It's the pleasures of the flesh personified. Christianity is the elevation of the Spirit, the union of the saints. I was talking to Cheryl the other day, and I told her something about heaven. I said, Cheryl, let me tell you something about heaven. When we get to heaven, everyone's going to love me just like you love me. And you're going to love everyone else just like you love me. There is going to be such a love in heaven. It has, you know why? Because in heaven, when you get there, you'll love me, as, uh, you'll love me like, like you love everyone else. There'll be no difference. Somebody says to me, well, I love my husband more than all of my... No, you won't. You will love us all the same. We all love the same. All of our love will be equal. It will be great and it will be fulfilling. Sex and jealousy and strife and prejudice will not exist. When Cheryl loves someone over there as much as she loves me, it will not bring up one single bit of jealousy in me because it will be pure love, not sexual. Sexual love confuses the issue. How many are with me? It confuses it. It's something for us here. God said it's not good for a man to be alone. He gives him a mate. And yes, it's sanctioned by God, but it confuses real love. Come on, somebody say amen. You have more crime for sexual things than you do for anything else. John Lennon thought that the utopia would happen without God. But it can only happen with God. Islam is a religion of hate, of violence, and of submission. Christianity is a movement of love 
and commission. Man, if the church understood what Christianity is really about, Jesus said, how will, they, how will they know your mind? It's by your love. He's trying to give us love. He came here giving us something that was in heaven. God is love. Listen, we miss the fact about heaven. Heaven is going to be a place of love, pure, unadulterated love. The greatest, all-encompassing emotion you'll will enjoy for all of eternity is love. Love without partiality. Love without sex. Love without hurt. Love without disappointment. Love without mistrust. Love without envy. Ask me what heaven is like, and I'll tell you it's like it's a place of perfect love. Why? Because this. God is love. If God is love, and you're going to experience God, then you're going to experience love. Real love. Now, how many of you love your wives? How many love your husbands? I certainly hope you raised your hand if they're here. <laughs> if you love your wife and you love your husband, you understand that love. That love, if you, if you live long enough, that love is not necessarily something that's all bubbly and physical. That, if you live long enough, that love is just a, a deep-seated emotion. Well, imagine that emotion for every single person in heaven. That deep-seated emotion that you have this tie-in with everyone. Because every single one of us have the blood of Jesus flowing through our veins. Every one of us who have been born again have his DNA spiritually. You are connected. This is what heaven's about. People ask me all the time about heaven. Forget about the clouds and the strumming of harps. That's pathetic. You're not going to do that. Listen, it's a love. It's, it's love. What does the Bible say? The Bible says God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. So this is the whole fact and fiber of heaven. So what is love? Well, the Bible says this. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always preserves. Sounds like heaven to me. Listen to me as we continue on tonight. Listen. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete, complete, full destiny with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. If I could take every one of us and go past this curtain tonight and put our heads right into heaven, you would see it's a place, that you would get a smile. You'd see it's a place of pure love. You will know me, Cheryl will know me as her husband, but let me tell you something. I will not be bothered one bit that she loves me as much as she loves the guy that's over there that she doesn't know. Because basically we're going to be like the angels. We're not going to have anything pulling us. It's not going to be because we have some type of sexual attraction. It's going to be an attraction to Christ, an attraction to God, and God is love. Paul tells us that in Ephesians. Let me tell you something. I think if we really leave this with anything today, let me ask you a question. Let's go back to this. Does Islam teach this? Is it patient? Is it kind? Does it not envy? Does it not boast? Is it not proud? Is it not rude? Is it not self-seeking? Is it not easily angered? It keeps the records of wrongs. Does it, delight? Does it not delight in evil? It's the total opposite of love. Now listen, I know there's a lot of people that were born into Islam. I know there's a lot of Muslims that are going to be listening to this. I know there's a lot of people that, that their family religion. And I understand that. I understand growing up in a family religion. I did. I had to leave it. The reason I had to leave it, it was, wasn't consistent with what I was feeling in my spirit. So what I'm asking for anybody that's listening to this that's Islamic is to check your spirit because God put a homing device in your spirit. Click it on. Just click that spirit on and see if I'm not telling you the truth. That you want to live a life of kindness and love. You don't want to live a life beating people up or killing somebody or having some war all the time. How old does that get how quick? You want love. I want to leave you tonight with what separates us from fundamental beliefs from that of Islam. Matter of fact, if you are Islamic and you're listening to this tonight, don't change your religion. Do what I'm about to tell you and it'll change you. Listen, here it is. Ten ways to love. Listen without interrupting, Proverbs says. Speak without accusing. Give without sparing. Pray without ceasing. Answer without arguing. Share without pretending. Enjoy without complaining. Trust without wavering. Forgive without punishing. Promise without forgetting. It's the crux of Christianity. And if you're somebody that's Islamic tonight, you cannot argue with me that those things are great to do. So if you start doing those things, I promise you, you're going to start seeing some problems with your religion that you've been involved in. Because your religion does not promote that. Only Christ does. Tonight, would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? Would you stand to your feet for a moment? Man, how many of you are learning a little bit about Islam? How many of you are enjoying these, stu these studies?
four of you are. That's great. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord. I thank you for your power and your, your promise, Lord God. I thank you that your kingdom is a kingdom of love. Lord, if we could see you in that first century, Lord, I think the thing that drew people to you was not your great appearance. Uh, Isaiah says you had no form or, or comeliness that we would desire you. It wasn't that you had some great looks, Lord, that would draw us in. There was nothing that you had that was so magical that the world would say. It wasn't even any type of charisma. You had an exuding love that when people were around you, they felt that love. And Lord, that's what I want. I want to be able to, I want to exude love, Lord God. I want to love my enemies. I want to turn the other cheek. It's all about, why did you tell us that? Because because that is what heaven is founded on. Because God is love. Lord, when we are there, we will understand perfect love. We will be known as we know, Lord. And we will understand the perfect love of God. For God so loved us and the world that he sent his only begotten. It's all about love. And I'm thankful tonight, Lord God, that we are not in a religion of controversy. We're not in a religion, Lord God, that teaches hate and violence. But we're in a, a movement of God that teaches us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Bless us tonight, Lord God. May we do the things that cause us to be Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.